Okay, time to wake back up. <laughs> no, your, your job as president is done. <laughs> Always be careful when the guy after you has the microphone. I don't know what he's talking about. I have the same amount of hair I had 15 years ago. I just outgrew it. Those that know it doesn't really, you don't really lose your hair. It just gets sucked into your head, comes out of other weird parts of your body. The, um, you, you know, it's funny. I, I listen to this, and I told you guys yesterday that I'm a, I'm a fan of coaches, and, and um, I've got three daughters. I, I, for four years, I coached uh, my little daughter's uh, softball team. And at one point in time, you're sitting there, and you're dealing with parents. And we all know what that part is like. And frankly, sometimes it's more about how do we manage those parents and the, the attitude we want around the team as it is the kids themselves. Well, how do you teach a six-year-old or a seven-year-old girl to throw the ball from first base or from third base over to first base? And then the first baseman at that age has to catch it and then step on the bag. And that's the only happens if the other kid running decides they're going to take a different route and, and how are you going to get the kid out? So I decided at one point in time, I said, you know what, the heck with this. I said, I'm not, I'm not throwing a first base. And so I grabbed the kids. I started everything over. I grabbed them differently in practice, and I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Wherever you get the ball, I just want you to go run and step on the nearest base. I don't want you to do anything else. I don't want you to listen to your parents. I don't want you to just don't do anything else. When the ball comes to you, grab it, run, and step on the nearest bag. Okay, and I didn't tell the parents initially I was doing this. So the next game comes, and we weren't winning, you know, games. You'd win games, you'd lose games, and, 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 you know, the kids are just trying to find some kind of success reinforcement. So the first ball comes to our third baseman. She grabs the ball, she walks over, and she steps on third base. The kid, there's nobody on base. The kid runs to first base, and the kid is safe at first base. Now all the parents are yelling, hey, throw to first, throw to first. And I said, you did a great job. And I'm applauding the kid. We're making it. We're hooting and hollering in the, in the dugout. Okay. Next one, kid hits it over to the shortstop. Shortstop was close enough to third base. She runs and steps on third base. Now I got first and second, nobody out. All right? I got parents looking at me like, are you nuts? Because I'm telling the kids, way to go, great job. What the parents didn't understand is I just had two kids field the ball cleanly. They can't throw to first base if they didn't field the ball cleanly. They, they can't, they don't even have the arm strength to get it there. So why am I even trying to tell that they know the out's there, but they can't get it there. So all you're doing is building frustration. Well, the next kid comes up, hits the ball to third base. Third baseman fields it cleanly, walks over, steps on the bag. We got one out. All right. Next one hits the ball to the second baseman. The second base fields the ball cleanly, steps on second base. We've got two outs. There's runners on first and third. The next batter to first base, first baseman steps on. We get three outs. We didn't give up a run, and I still have parents all frustrated with me. So after the game, I pulled all the parents together, and I basically said, look, it, it's like swimming. You don't throw your kid in the pool and say, okay, go do the breaststroke. You know, they, they, they don't know. They, they teach them to float. And then if they can float, they teach them a side lie. If they can do the side lie, which teach them how to breathe, then they start teaching them the freestyle. I figured the kids don't have the arm strength to throw from third base or the accuracy. And even if they did, then i got to rely on this other kid that's seven years old to try and catch that ball cleanly and step on the bag. Well, if I did short little plays where maybe you throw it underhand to somebody at second base rather than trying to go all across the field, we get success reinforcement. They bought in. We started to just kind of turn things around, and, and, and we started winning more games, but it wasn't about the winning for me at that point. It was the success reinforcement of what we were doing, and that was the development. A year later now, kids are getting stronger now from second base. Maybe we're throwing to first, you know, but still on the right side of the infield, on the left side of the infield, we're still keeping the plays over there, and it worked. Now, I don't know if it was the right move. I don't know if people would agree with it or not. All I know is we were – moving these kids along in a process. That's the challenge that coaches have. Now, the challenge that other coaches have is when you get kids to a certain level, how are we going to keep moving them up? Well, our next guest is going to tell you kind of how he does it. Don Granato is uh, really one of my favorite guys that, that I've met in this business. I had a pleasure working with him for one year uh, when he was here in St. Louis, and he's one of these guys that when you would go to the rink as a broadcaster, assistant coaches are invaluable to help you with just with information you may need, questions you may have, because you want to make sure you're putting the story out there right. 
But just the attitude was spectacular. Always smiling, always willing to talk, always saying hi, and always just being a part of everything and willing to help in everything more than just what was going on with the coaching duties. So now the assistant coach at the University of Wisconsin. Of course, he's been a head coach uh, at different levels in the American Hockey League and most recently five years of the National uh, Development Team program. And then let's go back a little bit further in 1990 when he won a national championship at the University of Wisconsin. So in a pretty cool move to be able to go back to Wisconsin and work with his brother and uh, turn that program around. And rather fitting, Donnie, we've got a Wisconsin shirt sitting right here in front for you. So let's bring up Don Granato and let's hear of... Uh, Welcome Don Granado to the stage and he'll tell us more about development of kids. Thank you all. Make sure my mic is working here. Um, great to be here. Uh, the presentation says uh, finding clarity and focus for a coach. Um, I'm going to wish myself luck on that because I've been trying for 20 years uh, or better. Uh, I know you had a great week. I know you've had great presenters. Um, I'm very excited to be here, certainly amongst that group uh, and, and without question in front of you guys. As uh, our president, uh, Jim Smith, just said within, with USA Hockey, uh, and Chris just said, my five years at the national team and working for USA Hockey uh, was amazing. Um, it was tough to leave. I knew it was going to be tough to leave whenever I left. Uh, but it was a great spot to work. Um, and I benefited greatly from the work that everybody did in this room. So uh, just to start out, um, I, can, I, I want to thank everybody for their passion. Uh, you're not here if you're not passionate about the game. Um, and not here uh, if you're not trying to get better. Um, and that's uh, something that can never go away. We always have to get better no matter how good we think we are. Someone's going to pass us if we don't get better and better. Um, but uh, that's why it's neat for me to be here. Uh, I've kind of hoped to live my life that way. I like being around people that uh, are passionate about the game uh, as I am. So, again, um, just the... Uh, the topic there, we're going we're gonna to jump around. So as I mentioned, you had some fabulous presenters this weekend, um, and they threw a lot at you. Uh, the, some of the areas, you know, player development, leadership, habits and reps, uh, and tactics. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, practice planning. I'll talk about, um, I'll start with really what influenced me as a coach and within this game, um, just in the context of who I am as a coach and what I've uh, tried to take, the approach I've tried to take, uh, and then obviously funnel that into the experience and what I tried to bring to our group at the national team program. Uh, the, di the dynamics. Um, we all deal with the dynamics. Um, and the pressure on players today, uh, Jim just mentioned Generation Z, it's a, different, it's a different, we have to do business differently. We have to coach differently. Uh, there's tremendous demands on players as there is coaches. Uh, there always has been, but it's increasing every day, and that's not going to change. And then the getting, a, getting to work, uh, I'll just talk about al alignment, how important that is. We all know, uh, you know, when you deal with a team, you have to be aligned in a vision, uh, and, and what you're going to do, not only the players, the parents, uh, and your staff. So I'll talk about that, uh, lead, leading, um, what that means to me, and then finish with some practice planning uh, and some ideas uh, and focus points I've had as a coach. Um, High-level coaching. Um, I, I've got that written on the sides. You, can, you think of, right away, you think of high-level coaching, and, and you think of, the Chicago Blackhawks or the Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, that to me is coaching at a high level. High level coaching is coaching the young players, is coaching the, the players that are five years old to 15 years old. That's high level coaching. Because all the players I got at the, the national team, if they didn't develop the skill, they were never getting there. They weren't getting there. 
I know that. So I benefited greatly at the national team program as a head coach because of what everybody did in this room to develop players early, early on. So to me, high-level coaching is the youth hockey. Uh, the ADM, um, again, all the presenters, fabulous, uh, incredible wealth of knowledge, experience, and success. Um, the ADM works. It's incredible what small area skill development does. And we'll get into that more. Um, I can tell you with Austin Matthews and Matthew Kachuk and Luke Cunning, um, I had 11 kids that I was lucky enough to, to be with on teams the last couple of years uh, that went in the first round of the draft. High skilled players. We did small area a large percentage of our practice. There was no sense of me trying to reinvent the wheel. Uh, development is development, and we'll get into that. Um, some, some more philosophies on that, but the ADM uh, is there, it's successful. Um, if you're coaching younger teams, keep that philosophy. Uh, and I put our logo, other logo down there, uh, is USA Hockey at, at large. Um, and the top I've, I've written down or typed in, stronger every day. We are stronger every day. I've spoke to, I, I've been asked to speak to groups in Sweden with the Swedish Federation the Finnish Federation, the Swiss Federation. It seemed like every time I'd go overseas the last couple of years, they'd say, hey, will you talk to our coaches? Uh, and the reason being is they want to know what we're doing at USA Hockey. They see it. They feel it. Um, Canada f sees it and feels it. Uh, we are impacting the world of hockey. And it started with the ADM, which is, again, you guys in high-level coaching. Uh, it's, it's tremendous to see. It's even better to feel. Um, you know, I love Canada. Uh, I'm glad Canada's here because it, it's an incredible, incredible hockey environment. But they're our competitor, and I know they're, they feel pressure from what we're doing here, and that's awesome. That'll make us all better. So, uh, again, uh, great job. A little bit of my background. Um, got talked into the next couple slides from uh, a good friend of mine who's out here. Uh, I came in yesterday. I'm sorry I missed uh, uh, the first couple days, but I asked... Uh, uh, this good friend, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Sean Brazel, uh, who's helped me, out, helped me out at the national team, just retired from uh, the military. Uh, Coach, thank you for your service. Where are you at? Thank you. So, so Braz is a, is a hockey guy at heart. Uh, he, he retired after 20 years. About a year and a half ago, he came into the NTDP and said, hey, I'm going to retire in a year. I'd like to uh, move and transition back into hockey. He was a hockey player prior to his service, uh, and he wanted to transition back. He's now working with our world junior team. Uh, he's now talking to NHL teams, and he helped us tremendously with the national team. So when I came in town last night, he got me up to speed on everything, and I, I went through, okay, what should we talk about today? Uh, I'm going to throw this slide in. This is, uh, uh, as Chris mentioned, my family. Uh, I was brought up, I had five brothers and sisters. My father owned his own business. I got a lot of coaching philosophies just watching my dad run his own business. Tony, in this picture here, uh, the caption says, suspended 15 games, Tony Granato. He, he clubbed, you can't see, but he clubbed. He literally clubbed Neil Wilkinson over the head and got 15 games. Tony was three years older than me, and that's him in the middle circle. This is me with the rockin' Stroh's beer shirt on. <laughs> that scrawny little guy. The circles are actually the same size. Now, this was our, I, I throw this picture up there. Braz talked me into throwing this up there. I didn't want to do that. Um, but I got over it. it. And we're at the Olympic Training Center. When my parents, we were this age, they knew nothing about hockey. Zero. All they knew was we were passionate about it after the 80 Olympics. But they knew zero about it. We knew nothing about it. We've come a long way personally. Uh, but somewhere along the line, I got really passionate about hockey. I just wanted to play hockey. And Tony, as you can see here, he's going to one of the U.S. festivals. I was always giving up about 30 pounds and the size difference. I got the crap beat out of me growing up every day. But if I wanted to, I, I loved hockey, so I wanted to play. I'd go right back down to the basement and take another beating. 
and over and over. And I didn't want to say no. The, 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 I wanted to play hockey. He pounded me. I loved having an older brother. I hated him until I was about 15 years old. Uh, then, I, then I thought, geez, I, I think I might actually like this guy. Um, and we've been pretty close ever since. But some of the lessons I learned, and this goes into one I speak. The first one lesson I learned, I learned it early. Be competitive or the beating gets worse. If I didn't compete, he just took advantage of me worse. So I learned to compete at a, at a young age. I try to instill that in our teams. Okay? It's, it's not a game we play, it's a competition. The most competitive teams and the most competitive people win with more consistency. So I try to bring that to our teams. We'll get into talking and educating players. I think that's one thing we, need to, we all need to educate our players on. Two, be resourceful. How can you adapt? I was giving up 30 pounds, so I had to think about everything. He never had to think about a damn thing. He just ran me over, and, but I had to think and try to figure out how can I win. Uh, third lesson was are you passionate? You've got to be passionate about what you're doing. And more than being passionate, we'll talk about inspiring. You've got to get other people passionate. Okay? We're growing. USA Hockey's growing. The biggest thing we can do as a, as a coach is to inspire. Take the influence we have as a coach and inspire people. Uh, lesson four, be humble. Boy, if I ever did win and I celebrated too much, I got the crap beat out of me then too. So uh, I, I learned to try to be humble, uh, but I think there's, there's a lot of value in that. Lesson five, be determined. Uh, we touched on that a little bit. But the late lesson in life I want to talk about. Okay, I didn't learn this lesson early. Uh, I asked Tony one time, I said, Tony, when did you know you were going to play in the NHL? And he looked at me like I had three eyes. He said, I, I, I knew I was going to play when I was 12. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I said, seriously? I said, yeah, 12 years old I knew I was going to play in the NHL. And he played 13 years. I, on the other hand, didn't have that dream. I wanted to play at the University of Wisconsin. I said, oh, that's my, there was my problem. I didn't, I didn't set my ceiling, my expectation high enough. So I lived without setting that high of an expectation. And obviously I didn't reach it. He played 13 years. I think that's a huge key to coaching. I think it's our responsibility to help players elevate their expectation. I've seen it a ton at the national team program. Big difference between some of these players coming in from small markets versus players that come in from big markets, our confidence. Confidence is stick their neck out and say, hey, I'm, put me on the ice or I'm going to make it. I'm going to play in the NHL. Um, we've benefited greatly, in my estimation, about having, when I, when I was a kid growing up, we didn't have former NHL players around to converse with. Even as, even as coaches, we were coached by my parents. It had been great, even if they coached, if they could sit and talk to a player in the lobby of a rink about, or a coach of another team in our organization that played in the NHL or played Division I hockey. That's a big, big difference today. Uh, and, and that's really, really helped us and helped our players gain a whole other level of self-expectation. Luke Cunning and the five players from St. Louis that were drafted in the first round this year. I had a few of them. I worked with them. Those kids had a very high level of self-expectation. They were around very accomplished people in our industry as coaches. There's no question in my mind that played a significant impact uh, in their success to this point and their future success. Um, some demands on the players. Uh, it's changing. It's changing. It's changing fast. Um, even the first group at the NTDP I had was the 95-born players. The group I just left with, I had 95, 97s, and then the 99 birth year was a team I just left this year. I can't believe the difference in how you need to communicate to players and kids born in 1995 versus 99. It's, it's amazing. You know, the 99s were, as, as uh, Jim just mentioned, uh, they grew up much more on the iPad and the iPhone. The 95s did not, and it's changed right in front of me. It was very, very interesting uh, and, and fun to see. And then the pressure. With that device comes more pressure, more, more demands, more influences on the player. 
You walk out after a game, we could, be, we could have been in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. That player will look at his phone, he might have four text messages. Mom, dad, his close friend, grandpa. They watch the game on fast hockey, they've got feedback for him. And they're asking him questions, okay? So the demand, and, and when, when the player's asked the question, he's compelled to respond. And we'll get into some of the questions that might be asked later. Just uh, times have changed. This is a letter that was circling uh, the internet a couple of years ago. Uh, we might have seen it, but right here in the middle where there's a break, I'll zoom in, and it says, uh, it's the, the letter's from the Toronto Maple Leafs, Punk, Punch Imlick. Uh, I think it was 1962, it says at the top. So this letter was going out to the Toronto Maple Leaf players that were coming in for training camp, the returning players. And in the letter he says, I expect you to report in good condition, not more than seven pounds over playing weight, with a minimum of being able to do 20 push-ups, 20 sit-ups, and 30 knee bends. That was for an NHL team. Think of the difference today, not only an NHL team, but what we're doing with our kids, the demand that's on our kids. That was a demand on, an, on a returning NHL player in 1962. It's incredible to think that was the demand on an NHL player with what we demand of our kids at the age of 10, 11, 12 even right now. So it's changed, we have to change. Uh, the, the red circles are what's influencing our players. It's very important for us to, to know what's out there. What, do, what are the circumstances that we're coaching under? And influencing our players, obviously our family, friends, peers, your hockey teammates, friends at school, uh, social media, uh, as they get older, advisors, media, fans, um, we don't have any control or very limited control over those as coaches. So all those red dots, they're going to influence our players. As I said, those text messages after a game, how come coach didn't use you in the shootout? How come you weren't on the power play in the last five minutes? Those are going to influence our players. That's just the parameters we're working under that's not going to change. The blue dots are what we have some control over. Our organization, our coaching staff, our culture. Uh, those are the areas that we have control over that we need to focus on to help influence our players. This is a questionnaire. I, I, my goal was to have a, a relationship with players um, that the, the players knew when they came on the, on the ice it was business and off the ice we were, the coaching hat came off, uh, we're people, we're living, how, we, how, how are we going to enjoy life, how can we enjoy life, how can we grow as people. So I got a lot of information and feedback from our players. Uh, they were great. Uh, this is a survey I gave the 95 birth year at the end of their two years at the NTDP. I asked them from the list, who's likely to confront you with questions or statements on things that are out of your control? Questions like I just said, how come coach didn't play, put you in the shootout? How come you're not on a line with so-and-so? And the player is sitting there, he might get this question right after a game, and how does he answer that question? The, the coach is an idiot? I mean, how, how do you answer that? And so you're putting the player, if you're asking that question, right in between because he feels like now he's got to give you an answer. That's pressure. That's pressure on a player. We've got to recognize that as pressure on a player. So on the list here, from the list, who's likely to confront you with questions outside of your check all that apply? Nine players check family advisor, asking them those type of questions where they feel compelled to answer. Mom, nine players check mom, and 14 players check dad. So, um, it just goes to show you the influence. Now I got a, a couple of masks up there with different faces. What I found in working with these elite level athletes was they felt that pressure. I received more than a handful of phone calls with a parent worried about the emotional state of their, their son. The, the NTDP is a very intense program, very demanding program. And I'd get a call every now and then and say, and it'd be a mom or dad concerned, say, really, I'm, I'm really concerned about Johnny. He won't talk to me. He's withdrawn. He walks away when we try to start talking about hockey. I just, 
I don't know. And my response is, okay, I, I'll keep a, we'll keep a close eye on him. I'll talk to my assistant coaches. We'll watch him. And wouldn't you know it, that could, that's a conversation. Usually it happens in, in the morning or the afternoon, early afternoon. And almost every case, we see the kid walk in the door, or I'll ask the assistant coaches, yeah, he's great. And the kid will walk in the door. One day that happened, and the kid literally walked in the, my front, our front door at the NTDP 10 minutes later. Hey, coach, how are you? But his parent was telling me how miserable he was. Well, he was miserable away from the rink because he had to answer all the questions of what I just said. And he didn't want to answer them. He was sick of trying to answer them. He just wanted to be left alone to play hockey. But when he walked in our door, he knew where he stood with us. And that's, that's our job as a coach. The player needs to know where they stand with us. And more than that, they need to know we value them as a person and as a player. There'll be another slide on that from Phil Jackson, but very important. And when you do it, they're happy. They should be. They should be happy when they play hockey. It's a great sport. We've got to, it's our job as a coach to get them to enjoy it, certainly at, at the levels we coach. Uh, the pressure on a player. Okay, This is a, just a quick look we did. I'm going to zip through the next few slides fairly fast. There's a, I did a presentation on this, on, the, on how hard it is to make the NHL for a player um, a year ago. Uh, with USA Hockey, that's online and, and it's much more extensive than I'll go into today. But this just gives you a, a good look. The big number on the bottom, 1,362. That's how many players were drafted from 2000 to 2008 in the NHL, NHL draft picks, that never played a game in the NHL. 1,362. So you think of how exciting that is on draft day. We got drafted. I got drafted. Your family, your relatives, your friends, everybody's excited. And 1,362 of those guys didn't even play a game in the NHL. And this, we looked at this, this is probably 2013, I think. It was four, f five years after. So there might be a couple that did make it, but pretty much that number. Uh, another 193 played 10 or, 10 or fewer games. I can tell you, if you're competitive, you're happy to be in the NHL, but if you play fewer than 10, you're no longer happy to, to have been there. You wanted more. So that brings that total to about 1,555 players. That's a lot. That's hard. That's hard. Um, if you want to play in the NHL, you've got to take somebody's job. That's, a, that's an NHL roster a year ago in the playoffs for the Chicago Blackhawks, and those numbers are the numbers of years those players have played in the NHL to that point. So if you look at the first line of forwards, Marion Hosa has been in the league for 17 years. So if you want to make the NHL, you're dealing with limited roster spots. There hasn't been a roster spot available earlier. There's been one less in the NHL for 17 years that Marion Hosa has been there. There's not turnover like you'd think there's turnover, like the kids are, and players are accustomed to year in and year out. So you can see the challenge of that. Um, and on the defensive side, the same thing. Tevu Teravainen is, is the guy in there in one, one year. Um, first year in the NHL. They call, recalled him. He was in the lineup that night. This was against Nashville uh, in the playoffs a year ago. He got called up from the minors. Uh, Versteeg or Carcillo was injured, and he got called up. So there's a guy, Tevu Teravainen, was a first-round pick, excited on draft day, sitting in the minors in the American Hockey League and not in the NHL. Not in the NHL because he wasn't given an opportunity. So um, that's a big difference as you move up and our players want to move up. That challenge to get a roster spot in the NHL. Um, to stay in the NHL, obviously, um, as I mentioned, you've got to take somebody's job. You, like Table Terravina, you have to be given an opportunity. So if you're in Rockford and you're, you're pouting because you're in Rockford, you were a first-round pick, I can guarantee you, if you're in the American League, there's guys that were picked after you in the draft, second round and third round, that might be up in other organizations. And you're going to have to deal with that. Again, that player is going to get questions. How come you're not up? So-and-so is up with this NHL team. He was drafted three rounds after you. 
and you've got to deal with that. So that, so when you get called up, you're going to be given an opportunity. You've got to be ready for that. You've got to be prepared to seize that opportunity. Might only be four minutes of ice time, but you've got to do it. Um, on that note, to be able to seize opportunity, I, I put this fairly crude grid together last night uh, on, on talking on this. If we look at the grid on the right, in the yellow there is youth hockey games. I worked with a youth hockey organization about five, six years ago. They had become an observed practices, so I, I watched six to eight practices, and then I watched six to eight youth games. Never did I walk out of the rink. But I watched the practices and I saw coaches were working on systems. Not, not extensively, there was a lot of ADM and a lot of skill, which was awesome. But they were still working on systems for a, a decent, some coaches more than others, but a decent amount of practice. In my opinion, too much on systems. When I watched the games, never, and I can't recall ever walking out of a rink watching youth hockey games, and I said to myself, the difference in the game was that coach's systems. Conversely, every time I've walked out of a rink and I thought about youth hockey games that I've watched, the difference in outcome was a complete discrepancy in skill. The most skilled team wins. They didn't, they were just tired. It wasn't a systematic breakdown. It wasn't systems, the reason they lost. So at the youth level, skill, skill, skill. When you lose a game, the other team, for the most part, is more skilled than you or better rested than you. You guys may, might not have been ready to play, but it's not the systems. If you think about the NHL level, uh, Mike Babcock, one of the best coaches there is, won a Stanley, went to the Stanley Cup Finals twice in 2008 and 2009. And he hasn't been back to the finals, but he's run the same system. What does that tell you? It's pretty simple. Even at that level, the skill is the difference. Arguably, the market says he's the best coach in the world. Deservedly so, he's probably the highest paid coach. He just finished 30th in the NHL. If you don't have the skill, the system doesn't run as well. Now he's won two Olympic gold medals in between the Stanley Cup appearances. He had the skill. The system worked better. So any system you run, the skill's gonna enhance what you're running. So again, I press on you the ADM and skill development. Now when you get into the blue area, junior hockey, college hockey, and the red area, pro hockey, uh, you, you, there's a lot of other components. You're not gonna get a chance there. You're not gonna get a chance at the NTDP, that's why I say high level coaching, if you don't have skill. So to get there, you have to have a certain level of skill. And you're gonna, you're gonna gain some game knowledge as you go through youth hockey, certainly. You're gonna gain some system knowledge. But the best players, I threw the Hobie Baker, this is the Hobie Baker trophy here. I threw that down there. One thing that fascinated me when I coached in the American Hockey League would, would I'd bring the players in that we'd sign. We'd sign college players at the end of the college season or sign a, a player out of major junior. And I'd ask the players. They were the best players on their teams, obviously. We just signed them. Um, in my time coaching the American League, I had six different Hobie Baker winners that actually played, played for me. So high profile guys. And I'd ask them, you know, what systems did your coach run? I was curious. I asked the question out of curiosity. And wouldn't you know it? They looked at me, and, and you could see the sweat on their brow. He's asking me about CISPA. And they'd, um, uh, we, we ran this one face-off play. And that's the stuff they could remember. They could remember systems. They were the best players. They didn't have to pay attention. I tell our kids all the time, and part of educating them, if Evgeny Melkin goes out on the ice and he gets scored on. Now, I won't, I won't speak for Mike Sullivan. He's a pretty damn good coach. But just, just look at it from a, from a theoretical side. If Evgeny Malkin goes on the ice and he gets scored on, comes back to the bench, Sidney Crosby's on the ice now, you're down a goal in your Pittsburgh, 
aren't you putting Evgeny Malkin back on the ice? You're down a goal. So your best players, when you're down goals and your most talented players, they're back out there. They don't really have to pay attention to details. Their skill is better than their competitors on, for that ice time. So when I get these players at the American League level, they're always the best players. So they actually lacked game knowledge and some other things that we'll talk about, but it was a challenge for them. So again, even if you're going to try to teach these guys a whole lot, uh, I think one of the presenters talked about concepts and habits. That's what you need to teach them. I always tell our play, told our players when they come to the national team program, it's not going to do you a darn bit of good to know what Don Granado's system is at the end of two years. You need to learn the game of hockey. We're going to hopefully teach you things that you can leave us and take with you. What are good habits? What are the concepts of the game? What are the concepts of competition? Those are the things that we want to impart on our players. Okay? And when you get to the top levels, everybody thinks that talent equals effectiveness. Talent gets you that job in the American Hockey League. But now everybody's skilled. And if you think about it, the most skilled players at the lower levels, they were productive in large part because they beat players, they scored goals against players that aren't going to be at the next level. So when that player moves up, when those players came into the national team with us, now they need game knowledge. Now they need to learn about what, what is my identity. How am I going to be effective helping us win? Okay? Um, just to, to zip through the NHL, scouts and agents, they're worried about potential. What's the ceiling? What's the ceiling? Like, God, this guy's incredible. He's six foot three. He skates like the wind. He's projections. But if you fast forward the player's career, three, four years down the road, he's going to be signed by an NHL general manager and he's going to try to play for an NHL coach. They're not seduced by, potent, by potential. They want results. And results are, are you effective in helping us win? That's how decisions are made. Okay, Very simple graphic to depict that. Ovechkin's ice time. I think this was game two or three in a Stanley Cup series against the Rangers a couple years ago. So the announcers on uh, the post-game show were talking about the ice time. Jay Beagle had 20 minutes of ice time in this game. Alex Ovechkin had 13 minutes. So Jay Beagle, a fourth-line guy, had seven more minutes of ice time than Ovechkin. Ovechkin made $9.5 million that year. Beagle made $900,000 that year. So all of that says, how would Jay Beagle get more ice time than Alex Ovechkin? That's the next level of hockey, where they were up a goal. So the coach said, Alex, we, we don't need a goal. You're a goal scorer. We don't need a goal right now. We're winning two to one. Jay Beagle's role, and he was effective at it, and he was better than Alex Ovechkin. He got the ice time. So the decisions change. It's no longer put our best player out there. It's we have to win, who's our most effective player, what's the situation. Um, another big thing outside of youth hockey. In all of these concepts, you, you could mention and talk to your players, but it's still skill development at the younger ages. They're not going to, you can talk to your blue in the face, they can go yeah, 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 and jump out on the ice and just out skate everybody and score if they're the best player. Uh, Anthony Lewis, I've talked to Anthony and he knows I use this slide. Uh, we were both together at the World Junior Camp. I was an assistant coach for the World Junior team a couple years ago. We're in Lake Placid, we go through three scrimmages. And I said, Anthony, I were at the dorms, I said, Anthony, how'd you, how, how do you feel you're playing? And he looked at me and we were together for two years at the national team. So we had a trust, we had a good bond. And he was excited, he looked at me, he goes, great. And he had a smile on his face. And you hate doing this as a coach, but you got to tell him the reality of the situation. And I said, Anthony, I'm glad you're doing 
you feel you're doing great, but if we were to make cuts today, you would be going home. And he just, shoulders drooped, and he, he looked at me like, I can't believe you're telling me that. And I said, tell me what you played. I said, you, you played with a pretty good line mate tonight. I said, did you use him, or did you just go challenge a guy one-on-one -on -one when you had him? His line mate that day was Austin Matthews. But Anthony wanted to try to make an impression and make the team. So he kept taking the puck to a defenseman and try to beat him one-on-one -on -one and looking off his line mate, who happened to be Austin Matthews. So he had great hands, great hands at youth hockey. And I said, Anthony, if you're trying to make this team with your great hands, get in line. We've got great hands out of Jack Eichel, Dylan Larkin, Austin Matthews. These were the guys in tryout camp. Sonny Milano. So I named him. He knew all these guys. I said, they all have great hands. And he kind of put his head down. And I said, what attribute do you have that all those players with great hands that you're trying to beat out with great hands, what attribute do you have that they don't have? Because you're right. You had great hands at the youth hockey level. And he, he kept thinking. I said, we've gone over this, Anthony. Speed. I said, now you're, you're close. And for him, it was quickness. There's, I don't know that there was anybody in our World Junior Camp as quick as Anthony Lewis. Dynamic quick. So every time he went and challenged a defenseman one-on-one -on -one, and Austin Matthews was standing there with incredible hands, he could have punched it to Austin Matthews and it could have been in his foot. He would have kicked it up. Anthony darted around the defenseman because it's quickness. Nobody's going to keep up with him. So for him, he needed to learn he's, he's better without the puck for an instant. Because every time a pass is made, everybody turns, and he can take advantage of that with his quickness. Just a give and go. So he had what I would call an identity crisis. His skill set at the previous level, he thought, was the same skill set he could impact the game at the next level. It's going to be hard for him to get a roster spot at the NHL if you think all your attributes carry over to the next level, because they don't. So for him, he did great the next day. He was great for us on the World Junior Team, but it was a process for him. It's a process that all these players will go through. Um, demand on coaches, we'll go over uh, system scenarios, practice opportunities, and then influence and, and time, time to influence. Uh, Phil Jackson. This is a book that basketball is about 20 years ahead of hockey and dealing with all this egos and crisis and management of that. And Phil Jackson, I think, is one of the best. Um, loved reading his books. This, is, this was one of his first books. And in 1987, he said, before joining the, Bo the Bulls in 1987, I was ready to say goodbye to basketball. Uh, let my 20-year career in the sport become history. Over the years, I'd grown disenchanted with the way money Power, self-glorification, tainted the game I love. So that was Phil Jackson. It's a great book. Uh, again, I think it's 20 years ahead of basketball, the, the, the issues they've had to deal with. We're just starting to deal with some of those issues. So he, I think his, this book, specifically of his, provides some great insight. Great insight. And I love his philosophy on coaching. Um, systems. So if we just look at systems, we'll go back to systems and coaching now. We went from players and the demands on them to coaches. So active flow situations in the game. So you should have a system for each active flow. First of all, start with manpower. You're going to do things differently if it's a five on five or a six on five or a five on four or four on five or three on five or five on three. So you've got all different manpower situations. How you break out, how you end a zone, how you back check, four check. So, and then possession. Do you have the puck? Do you not have the puck? Is it an, does the other team have the puck, or is it a neutral puck? So if you multiply all those together, I think you get 135 different scenarios that you'd have to have a system for. 135 different scenarios. I mean, you need a system when you're five on four entering the zone, and five on four in the offensive zone, and five on four in a breakout. You need a system for all of that. So that's 135 potentially, 
system focus points, implementation. Now you add up face-off scenarios. So the other one was flow of the game. If you had face-off scenarios, you get the manpower again, win the draw, lose the draw, and the different zones, offensive zone, neutral zone, defensive zone. There's 270 scenarios right there. So you've got, on the right side, 405 different situations. How do you simplify 405 different situations? The obvious answer is you can't. You can't do it. There's just not enough time. But that said, how little time is there for systems? This is a couple schedules. The Toronto Maple Leafs schedule. And I just pulled this off the internet a few years ago. And the schedule on the right is a schedule I had coaching the American League. And it, and it dawned on me all this pressure. You know, how in the world? In the American League coaching is, is, is a real challenge because you want to implement systems. If I sat here and listened to, to, the, to the guys that, that, that spoke, and I have in the past, and you're so excited with all the new information, power play this, and enter in the zone this, and neutral zone this, and, and, and you're excited. You want to implement all this. So I looked at, on the right, the American League team I was coaching. And in the American League, you don't get your players until the very end of an NHL training camp. So your best 10, 8 to 10 players, they keep them up in the NHL to play exhibition games to rest some of the veterans. So they think, I got a real chance of playing in the NHL. I'm one of the last cuts. And then they get cut about the day or two before the American Hockey League season starts. And they're miserable because they thought they were close. Was it their last chance? What did they do wrong? So they come down to the American League, and they, it's tough for them to focus. I get it. And as an American League coach, now you're going to play Friday night and Saturday. You just got them in town on Thursday. Maybe you got them in town on Wednesday, and you gave them a day off. How can you implement systems? So I looked at how challenging that was as a coach to implement systems. So on the schedule on the right, there were 53 days where I considered them designated practice days, where the players should have been committed to practicing at some level of intensity. We didn't play a game the night before, and we're not in a situation where we play a game the next night. So there's no game the night before, and there's no game tomorrow. So now I got their attention. They, they can, I can push them hard today, and they can practice hard. There were 53 practice opportunities like that. Everything else was either the day before a game or the day after a game, where they need rest. So 53. Now, when you coach at the pro level, they're pros. I just left the University of Wisconsin yesterday, or two days ago. We had NHL alumni on the ice training like mad, skills coaches, strength coaches. And they're in there for four hours. That's the off season. That's what you do in the off season. They're trying to make themselves better. The way these schedules are set up in the NHL is self-preservation. They need every ounce of energy they can to perform it in a game at the NHL level. So in between games, they're, from a player perspective at that level, they need the rest. They need to recover because they're scheduling games to give them just the minimum amount of recovery time and let's play again. Let's get a game on TV. Let's get revenue stream coming. So the, the NHL player is on self-preservation mode because of the schedule right away. But back to the just general pro hockey. So I'm running a practice at the pro level. Efficiency and effectiveness, I had it in the first slide. You've got to be efficient, and what's the most effective? So if I run a, if I run a practice and I call the guys in, the, the practice started at 10 a.m. It's now 11.01 a.m., and there's a clock right behind me in the building, and the players call them in. Those players won't even be looking at me at the pro level. They'll be looking over my shoulder at the clock and thinking to themselves, does this guy know what he's doing? Does he know we're, we're pro hockey players? I mean, and it's over an hour we've been out here. So you've got to be really creative to be and, and, and have a great aligned organization to practice over that. And how much more can they handle over that hour with the schedule they have? So that's what you're under at that level. Now the youth level, it might be just as bad or worse when we're talking about trying to implement systems. 
I've been around youth teams. You just don't have enough time. You don't. And you know it as well as I do. In the, in the pro level, you get the trainer walks in the door and you're like, all right, who's not practicing today? And screws everything up. You might have planned practice. It just screwed it right up. 45 minutes, an hour before practice. And I know at the youth level, it's the same thing. Johnny didn't show up again. Bobby's 20 minutes late again. So it's just what you deal with. Those things aren't going away. They're going to happen. Um, another Phil Jackson. Uh, knew the only way to win was consistently to give everybody from the stars to number 12 player on the role a vital role. Not just a role, a vital role. So very important, I think, for coaches to make your players feel important. I'll give you a quick, we had Austin Matthews, obviously an outstanding player. He's an outstanding person, wonderful person. He could go right through everybody on the ice, and he'd come back to the bench, and I'd never tell him, oh, and I'd never go and gush about his talent, certainly not in front of his teammates. I would say, hey, you know what I liked about that goal was the back check 10 seconds before, or the work ethic, or the competitiveness. That goal was nothing but competitiveness. Even though everybody saw, coach, are you crazy? That was all skill. You want to bring your concepts, what you stand. You know, that was an op that's a, those are opportunities for you as a coach to instill what you stand for. And it was competitiveness, work ethic, determination. Okay? Um, time to influence. There's a, probably a three-hour window when you're, when you're at the rink. Uh, when the player's at the rink. That's it. It's all you have to influence players. We saw all the influences they have on them. That's why I challenge you guys. Y you can't influence them. you got to inspire them. Inspire them so when they walk out of the rink, they want to talk about what you just did. They can't wait to come back. They're excited with what's laid out. I want to get back to the rink. You're not going to do that. You know, coaching in the position is a position of authority. But that doesn't mean you're motivating or inspiring. The best coaches motivate and inspire. And even though you only have them at the rink for three hours or one hour, how are you impacting them the rest of the day with what you did at the rink and how you talked to them and what energy you brought to what they're doing? So to me, that's very important. Um, what's happening? Okay, again, influencing forces the player's beliefs and then actions. So that's kind of just the dynamic that's going on behind the scenes. So everybody that's influenced them, so that's why you want to influence your players. Don't just say, oh, I got one hour in practice. Make it a great practice. Make them look forward to coming back. Make them talk about it in the car. Uh, what's our job? Is winning our job? I've always looked at our job as a coach as increasing our chance of winning. Who knows if you're going to win? The referee could be awful. This could happen. This could ha that could happen. We don't know if we're going to win the game. Our job is to increase our chances of winning. Prepare, compete, execute. But at the end of the day, this graphic up here, uh, one of the teams I had, we lost a U18 World Championship, a gold medal. Gold medal, we lost the game. I felt terrible for our kids. It was awful. But if you look at the graphic, we outshot them 35 to 12 in the gold medal game. 35 to 12 we outshot Canada in Sochi and we lost. Even to this day I don't agonize over it. The guys played hard. They executed what they could. We eliminated Russia in Russia two nights before. Huge peak. But our guys left it on the ice. Sure, you're going to say, oh, we could have done this and should have done that. It's natural. But at the end of the day, I've never felt bad as a coach when our team competed, when we did things to increase our chance of winning. That's what we have control over. Stick to it and hang on to it. Um, that's controlling what we control. Just a cycle, a process of performance. So you've got the game. Performance, it should be instinctive. Post-game is analysis, maybe talk about it, tell players what you're going to do in practice, why you're doing it in practice, and then it moves back to subconscious. So for me, 
I, I would watch a ton of video, but I wouldn't show my team a ton of video. I'd show them just a couple of clips. I'd talk to them about stuff, and then as we moved toward game time, I'd push them. You've got to be instinctive. You've got to be in the moment. Okay? And even on the bench in games, I don't like players worrying. So some, some guys come back and ask me a question, what, what should I do there? What should... And if I sense worry in them, I say, listen, stop worrying. We'll, we'll talk about it on Tuesday. Right now, you've got to play. You've got to thrive on this. You've got to enjoy playing. Um, I'm going to sit by this. The foundation. So if we think about systems and system work, okay, systems aren't the foundation. Habits are the bedrock. So if you're building a house, the systems would be in the white up there. The habits and concepts and skill development. As we've mentioned and other coaches have mentioned, everything runs better with better skill, better habits, and players knowing the concepts. Stick on puck. That's a concept. It becomes a habit. You're either doing it every time or you're not doing it every time. That matters. Okay? So, um, and skill obviously increases execution. Okay? Uh, just some, some laws. I, I wrote, this, wrote this up. And just thinking about the game of hockey. Time and space. You give a good player time, they're going to make a play. You take time away and space away. Okay? And that's what the good teams do. That's what good systems do. They want to take time and space away. Better players and better skilled players, they operate better than another player in limited time and space. Patrick Kane, if you jump at him too quick, it doesn't matter if you're confining, confining time and space, he's still confident his skill level's high enough, he's going to make a play on you. Okay? So players are basing their decisions in the game on time and space, actual and perceived. So if I think a guy's coming to hit me, I'm getting rid of the puck. Now, I might not have needed to get rid of the puck. It's my perception that this guy was hitting me. Your more skill, the more you develop a player's skill, the more confident they are to possess the puck. I talk to our players about scope. If, the, if your scope is the guy right in front of you, and this is your world, you're in trouble. You're not going to play the game at the next level. And the, and the more skilled player has a wider scope. He can see more of the ice because his skill, he sees the player in front of him, but the player's not a threat because he has the skill to pr either protect himself or move the puck. The player with less skill, that guy right in front of him, is a greater threat. So that's an indication of the skill level of the guys on your team as it relates to your level. Okay? And that would be something for you to assess. Uh, just a plan, and again, I have efficiency and eff effectiveness up there. Just something, some things now move into coaching at the NTDP. Our philosophies as a coaching staff, I had some great assistant coaches with me over the course of five years. Uh, we, we put all this stuff together. Coaching approach, establish a mindset. Again, that's the self-expectation. Um, I even worked to establish a mindset for our parents. We had parent meetings the start of the year, an orientation meeting. Very important to establish the mindset, even with them. Hey, listen, our focus is on development, competitiveness, work ethic. I don't care who's our leading scorer, who scored more goals and so-and-so. It doesn't make any I'm not looking at it that way. So you're setting a tone and you're managing uh, some expectations. Okay? Mentor. Uh, when we'd get these players into the national team program, it, was, it became evident right away that they hadn't made life decisions for themselves. So we did more mentoring with that than we did actual coaching of hockey the first three, four months. Okay? Um, provide insight on what's ahead. That's some of the stuff I talked about earlier. Inspire, make it fun, and then progress. A lot of guys think, I had a, I had a high school friend of mine, a coach, uh, that's a friend of mine, coach in high school. He's all worried. He says, coach, we got some kids that I just don't know how committed they are on my team. I want to win a state championship. I said, Matt, let's just say hypothetically, one to 100. The team that wins it, they're going to run at about just a sheer number, 65. They're going to hit for efficiency and effectiveness. 
their high school team. They're going to have their problems, their challenges, everything else. But they're going to hit 65. Your team's at 33 right now. Don't focus on 65. It's a distraction. You can't control 65 right now. If you've assessed your team, and you've got to assess your team accurately, and you assess them at 33 as in relation to their competitors, just work on 34. Just progress. It's amazing what you can do in this game if you just take one step at a time. Incremental steps, okay? Because you're going to get frustrated, and that frustrated is not going to inspire anybody. Frustration. Um, so a little bit on mindset. If you listen to the, the media when you watch NHL playoffs, you'd think that, my God, and this is, this is what influences you. Their power play is terrible. They're never going to win the Stanley Cup. This is Stanley Cup winners where they ranked in power play in the playoffs. The last nine cup winners. There was one cup winner that was fifth. Everybody else was below fifth in power play. Tenth, twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth, sixth, sixth, ninth in the power play. But if you listen to the announcers, well, they're not going anywhere. The power play is terrible. Really? Because you can see. So, point in this slide is caution on what influences you. Because I can tell you the stat that really matters in the NHL playoffs, ability to score five on five. If I put a screen up on that, I've watched it for 10 years now, close. The teams that can score five on five win. But if you listen to what's going on, it's the power play. So again, the only reason that's up there is what's influencing you. Mindset, this is a great book. This is a book I recommend to all our parents. I don't have stock in this book. I use it every time. But, but uh, it's a great, great book for, for coaches and parents alike. Um, the year I was with the Blues, the Dallas Drake, I talked to, called Dallas yesterday. I said, Dallas, can I tell the story about when we were together with the Blues? And Dallas Drake was, I don't know, a 12, 13-year veteran in the NHL. NHL training camps, the first four days, the coaches sit up top. And in scrimmage, you got too many guys to run practices. you got 60, 70 guys, you too many to run a practice. Four days of scrimmage, you send 30 out, and now you're down in a working group where you can run two practices, and the coaches want to implement their systems now. So the first day, we're going to do neutral zone four check. I'm on the ice with Dallas Drake as an assistant coach. Wouldn't you know it, we're, we're doing this, and Dally comes back to the bench after a, one rep of the drill, and he's like, Donnie, what do, we, what, do I, what do I do there? What's... And I looked at him, and I, 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 I actually thought he was kidding for a second. I thought he was trying to play me. I said, what, Dally? He said, what do I do there? Do I, you, I'm holding there? Am I pushing? Am I stepping? And I said, Dally, I just watched you for four days in 10 years in the NHL. Just do what you've been doing. You're doing it right. And his response was, well, I don't want, I don't want him mad at me the head coach. That was a guy that's been in the NHL for over 10 years at that point. As Soon as we made him start thinking, it was a form of paralysis. He didn't realize he'd, he'd been executing it. For the four days of the scrimmages, he was executing it perfectly. But now we made him think. So, so with, with that, we'll flip to the NTDP. More on a practice. In practices for me, this logo has been powerful, just do it. Get players moving. Again, we do it a lot of small area games. If I pulled up the dictionary, I looked up teaching and developing. Okay, To teach, and highlighted in red there, is to show or explain, to induce by punishment. That's actually in the dictionary under teaching. To induce by punishment. So, when I would talk to youth hockey coach, never mind teaching. Slow down on the teaching, willing your knowledge onto them. They need to develop. Kick them in the rear end and get them moving. Put Austin Matthews against Luke Cunning in the corner. That's what I would do. Those kids that I mentioned that were first round picks, I got a, I got a kid that's high skill and another kid that's high skill. Throw a puck in a small area and make them battle. Now they're going to develop. I didn't try to reinvent the wheel. I didn't try to impose my knowledge on them. They needed to develop. And the best way for that is action. So you can see develop in red. 
to grow or cause to grow, to become more mature, advanced, to convert. Okay? Uh, players, 350 goal scorers. Coaches worry about technique. I can tell you, they all, this is in 2008, 350 goal scorers. They all shoot differently, they all skate differently, they all pass differently. You could argue all. They're all different. Different skating styles, shooting styles, passing styles. So is there a cookie cutter way to do it? No, 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 come here, you've got to do it exactly this way. What did they all have? Passion, love for the game. Drive, confidence, those are the commonalities. So, again, practice, be dynamic, be demanding, think developmental. I would challenge our coaches every day. Every day. That's our job for practice. Be dynamic, be demanding, think developmental. Practice responsibilities of assistant coach. Okay? Work with your assistants. Train them, teach them, tell them how valuable they are. They are valuable, extremely valuable. Um, moving the group sounds simple. Just getting guys going, hey guys, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. If you watch a football practice, I'm amazed. You've got 100 guys in the field, and the assistant coaches are incredible at moving guys around. They practice small area snaps, small area kicks, small area blocks. You know, there's, I watched our Badger football team a couple days ago. There were, there were nine stations going on, and they go on for three, four minutes, and they move to something else, and the coaches are screaming, hey, hey, let's go, move, 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 and they got them going. So there's a lot you can do as an assistant coach. Keep that practice moving. Get the cones ready. Get the pucks ready. Get guys in the line. Get the first guy ready in line. Uh, verbally, repeat themes. Harder than that. Harder than that. Stay in the net. Stay in front. Stay in front. All those things. Uh, captain material. I know we had a talk on leadership. This kid is, is a St. Louis kid, Luke Cunning. Fabulous kid. Incredible kid. He was our captain, and he was a third line, third line guy, played some fourth line with us on our national team, our U18 team. But he was our captain. We had guys ahead of him, you know, as I mentioned, Hannafin, Wierenski, uh, Austin Matthews. He was the leader. Your leaders, they gotta be workers. They gotta be workers. Sometimes a competitive guy breaks rules. He might not be a great leader. Just because he competes doesn't mean he's a leader. But if you can get a worker that's competitive, now you're going the right direction. And really values winning, you got a home run. And then the last one is ability to separate personal and professional. Where he knows I'm driving him when we're a coach on the ice, but off the ice he's not afraid to walk in my office. Hey coach, this is what's going on. So that's what I look for in leadership. He, he was uh, incredible. Um, and then to finish, the standard. So when I have a team, what I, what I think is really important to pose to the players all the time, are you helping our team? And are you making yourself better? And, and you can say that to them every day. How are you helping our team? Are you pushing that guy when you go against him? And are you making our team better? Or are you making yourself better? To me, that's a foundation. So I thank you for all for, for having me. I certainly thank USA Hockey for having me. I hope that was uh, helpful. And um, I wish everyone the best. All right, Donnie, thank you very much. I'll bet to you, when you're talking about practices, you had a totally different challenge when you were the head coach in Worcester, and your bus rides are sometimes 45 minutes, maybe to an hour and a half, versus when you're Peoria and your travel is completely different. Yeah, there, I mean, it is a, it's an adjustment, Chris, where you, you have to adjust to things as a coach and then figure, okay, I'm, the situation is this now. How can we maximize the opportunity that we're left with? Uh, but when we were in Worcester, you're right, we, we had 13 hotel days on the road the entire year because geographically we had so many common or close opponents, which was awesome for development. Makes a big difference. Folks, uh, let's thank Don Granato for coming by. Now, now before you go to your breakout session, I'll give you the rooms here in a minute, in a second. He talked about the influence that broadcasters have so uh, we can put our Vulcan mind probe on you all with our stats. But uh, Ken Wilson, longtime broadcaster for the St. Louis Blues, excellent, excellent broadcaster. He gets pulled into a meeting. And this is right before the playoffs start. I'm convinced to this day that this is more of an agenda than it was an actual happened. He gets pulled into a meeting with himself, the executive producer of Fox Sports Midwest. 
and he's told, look, we've got a problem with the way Kenny's doing the games, and here's why. When he goes on the air and he says, well, the Blues have the number one power play and the Blackhawks have the worst penalty kill in the league, our fans are expecting the Blues to score. And when they don't score, then our fans get upset. Now, I can tell you, my time here with the St. Louis Blues, I've never been told what I can and cannot say on the air. As a matter of fact, it's just the opposite. I've been pulled into a meeting before and said sometimes we take it too easy on guys. But the same guy that told me that is the same guy running this meeting with, with Ken Wilson. So Kenny goes, are you kidding me? Like, it's just the stats. It, it's not – I've got nothing to do with that. I mean, if they score, they score. If they don't score, they don't score. And, uh, and so, smartly, the executive producer of Fox Sports and West says, why don't you show me some of those emails? Because he didn't believe this junk either. And uh, naturally, the emails weren't readily available to be seen. But nonetheless, Kenny says, in, in a way that only Ken Wilson could do, and Chris back there would know, listen, okay, no problem. I'll take care of it. Well, unfortunately for the Blues, Kenny was going from that meeting out onto the stage as we're about to begin the playoffs for a pep rally. Bernie Federico knew nothing of this meeting that was happening between Kenny and the bosses. Bernie gets up in front of 1,000 people outside of Scott Trade Center, then Savas Center, stands in front of them, and we're about to literally the playoffs start in about an hour and a half. Bernie? Playoffs are here. Or Bernie says, Kenny, the playoffs are here. How do you think the Blues are going to do? And Ken Wilson stood right in front of 1,000 people right outside the building an hour and a half before game one. He goes, Bernie, I don't think they're going to win a game. True story. Actually stood in front of everybody and says, I don't think they're going to win a game. How's that for decreasing expectations? And he walked right off the stage. <laughs> can't, I mean, you can't make that stuff up. But so... I guess we do have an influence over some things. All right, let's go to the breakout sessions here, and then one more speaker afterwards.